morning. Thank you for your patience. I'd like to first of all give you a little background on the Committee for Dulles for those who are attending and may not be familiar with the organization. The Committee for Dulles was founded in 1966 and is the oldest member sponsored organization promoting Dulles Airport. As Dulles Airport continued to expand over the years since 1966, the work of CFD became increasingly more significant. The committee has played a significant role in fostering and promoting the growth of Dulles during, through dramatic changes that have occurred over the years. We continue to focus today on the energy, our energies towards maintaining Dulles Airport as the major economic engine for the region and the Commonwealth. The subcommittee, there's actually the committee under the Committee for Dulles, the Aviation Airport Activities Group uh, is, a, is a very vibrant committee. We provide a vehicle for the members of the Committee for Dulles to engage in, small, in a smaller group environment with staff and executives from the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authorities, representatives from the airline industry and other airline related organizations and businesses. The Aviation Airport Activities Committee works to keep the Committee for Dulles up to date on changes at the airport and issues that impact passengers, airline services, cargo, security, and the like. We're very pleased to provide some very unique opportunities to see the, what goes on in the inner workings of the airport. And as soon as our COVID situation and a little better and people are vaccinated, we're hoping to get back into that environment. I'd like to thank our committee members who include Logan Antigone, Jim Bonfields, Dick Datos, Brandon Ferris, Dave Kirby, Paige Croner, Howard Lance, Sheila Holmes, Marsha Sennett Sydney was and our newest member, Paul Puckley, who I am so proud to have uh, involved today, and he will be introducing our wonderful speaker. I'll turn it over to you, Paul, and again, please accept my apologies for running late. Apology accepted, Georgia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for, for those of you who, who don't know Bill Swalbar, Bill um, Bill's a resident of Loudoun County, and um, he's been a friend of mine for many years. Um, He's a highly respected specialist in, in a multitude of aspects of the air transportation industry. Uh, Bill has spent 40 years in the consulting world with a focus on regulatory issues governing air transport, communication strategies and support, airline labor cost restructuring and air service development on behalf of airports and communities. In his consulting roles, Bill has represented airlines, airports of all sizes, investors, manufacturers, and labor groups. He is also a, um, a much sought after speaker and has provided expert witness testimony before various tribu tribunals and before the United States Congress regarding the economics of commercial air transport. Bill is widely quoted in the financial and mainstream press on issues impacting air transport. Currently, Bill holds several positions within the aviation industry and included among these positions are uh, chief industry analyst with the Swalbar Azam Consultancy Group, a commercial aviation economic analysis and research firm that specializes in complex issues emanating from structural changes to the airline industry. He's also serving as a senior advisor with McKinsey and Company and its transport logistics and infrastructure practice. Uh, Bill has, a, has been a research engineer uh, in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's International Center for Air Transportation since 2006 where he's affiliated with the Global Airline Industry Program and Airline Industry Research Consortium. He's currently, um, also currently serves as a member of the Board of Directors of Hawaiian Airlines. And he was appointed to the U.S. Department of Transportation's Working Group on Improving Air Service to Small Communities. So as you can see, Bill has a um, wealth of knowledge of the air transportation industry. And I'm confident that, that you will all find his presentation today extremely interesting and most enlightening. And with that, I will ask my, my good friend, Bill Swalbor, to share his thoughts with you. Bill? Great. Paul, thank you so very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, nice to see you, albeit virtually. <laughs> and um, I understand that some of you on, on, on the, uh, on, on the uh, program today um, talked to United last week, and that's terrific. And I promise that I'm going to do nothing um, that would upset that conversation in any way. Um, the title of the presentation, and this is something that we have been updating monthly since March of last year, um, titled it Landed in a Pandemic, Departing in a Recession. And this time around in 2021, it's all about vaccinate, stimulate, and reinvigorate. 
Um, if we think about just where we were last year, um, in 2020, domestic traffic ended the year at 41.4% of the 2019 level. Needless to say, it's all about the economy, restoring consumer confidence, and the return of international travel is going to be very important, um, not only to the industry, but also very important um, to the continued uh, good work that's done at Dulles uh, by EMWA and the Air Service team. And um, we will see that return, but I don't think any of us really appreciate just how important that international travel is to the domestic network that we see at Dulles. So it's very important that that comes back. Uh, when we look at Dulles compared to other United hubs in, the system, in their system, only Denver and Houston uh, carried more traffic as a percent of 19 than Dulles. DCA, and we will talk about that a little bit because I don't think we can talk about our marketplace without that. Um, major points in the Northeast, of course, have been locked down and a very small percentage of, of 2019's traffic was carried by Americans Network um, at DCA. Uh, international travel performed admirably um, at Dulles compared to other gateways in 2020. But again, as I mentioned, it'll be slow to return given the many factors that are impacting transoceanic travel today. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I, I, Europe uh, continues to put out headlines that we would prefer not to see. Um, the influence uh, of that international travel is mentioned nearly 12% of the domestic traffic at Washington Dulles is comprised of passengers connecting to and from an international flight. You know, much discussion today of vaccine and therapeutics. I think we're all excited to the fact that um, it sounds like uh, if we're eligible, we should be able to get, get a vaccine fairly soon. Uh, but I'm not so sure um, that the timetable is going to allow allow international travel to come back uh, in, its, in the form we would like over the summer months. Uh, this slide takes a look at a forecast that we did in April of 2020. Um, we predicted, uh, our firm predicted that um, uh, the U.S. total domestic market would be the equivalent of 40% of 2019. In actual, it was 41.4%. Um, in 2021, uh, we predicted in 2020 that the market would be 55.6% of 2019. And in 2023, 22, 73.3. Watching closely, yes. Um, it, these are two numbers where I want to be very wrong. Um, but let's not forget that we may have a great summer um, but we're still not to 50% of, of 2019 traffic as we sit here at the end of, of March. Um, the good news is, is we are now over a million passengers per week uh, moving forward as measured by TSA. There are encouraging signs out there, uh, but the fact is, is this market took a tremendous uh, demand shock. Uh, just to kind of put this in perspective, and I thought I would just look at traffic over the last decade as a percent of 2019, and we see a very steady build. Um, and then in 2020, the precipitous drop that occurred across the domestic industry. In 2020, total operating revenue for the industry decreased more than $110 billion dollars. Yep, that's kind of some small economies out there. Um, total operating expenses only were could be reduced by 50% of revenue. And for those of us in the in, on the call that run businesses, we fully appreciate that it's much harder to take costs out, um, particularly in an industry where there's a lot of fixed cost um, in order to keep pace uh, with the uh, resulting revenue drop. As a result, operating profit decreased by nearly $56 billion for the industry in 2020. And you could say that three years of operating profit were lost in one. Pre-tax profits, uh, probably a better measure because it takes into account the interest expense that the industry pays 
uh, pre-tax profit is an oxymoron. The pre-tax loss uh, was $63 billion in 2020, and that equated to 15 quarters of pre-tax profit being lost. In order to offset that, it was very, very important that the industry raise cash and raise cash quickly because in this industry, cash is king. Um, and we ended the year, um, the industry ended 2019 with $15 billion in cash. Um, by the end of 2020, the industry held $43 billion in cash. Um, but in order to do that, um, as you can see on the right side, the industry needed to borrow $51 billion for that cash level. And the fact that the cash level is less than um, the borrowed amount, um, yes, the industry was burning through tremendous amounts of cash every day through 2020. Um, this takes a look at the industry, um, uh, its, its recovery, uh, according to passenger screen by TSA. Uh, it reached a low of 4.7% of 2019 um, and ended the year at, 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 again, as we said, 40%. You can see the holiday peaks at Labor Day, at Thanksgiving, and at Christmas. And even with those peaks, uh, we, never, we barely exceeded 40% of 2019's level. If we look at where we are in, in, in 2021 and comparing that to 2019, um, we're gaining on 45%, and this is very encouraging. We should be to 50% hopefully soon. Um, but uh, uh, again, um, you know, it's, it's a slow track. And, and yes, there's good news out there, but there is a lot of ground to cover um, in order to regain um, the health uh, that the industry enjoyed pre-pandemic. So if we think about the airlines a little bit, I think it's safe to say that the big three network carriers, American, Delta, and United, are likely going to cede market share to the seven other carriers, and predominantly lower cost operators in the domestic market. Um, you know, you can look at Dulles and you see Southwest and, and, Maybe we'll see more um, as Washington is discovered. And, um, you know, the, the interesting part in 2021, in, in we're actually going to see two new entrants in the business um, by, the, by the end of the year. And some could be fairly soon. Um, and that will be the first new, they will be the first new entrants in the market um, since JetBlue entered in the year 2000. Um, our view has always been that Southwest and Allegiant will take full advantage of their balance sheets to grab U.S. domestic market share. That is certainly happening. Um, and they are joined by Spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, what's interesting this year, for those of you who um, kind of follow the industry closely, just recently Frontier and Sun Country Airlines filed their initial public offerings and were able to um, you know, uh, they sold out. Uh, people wanted to buy airline stocks, especially those that have lower cost structures and the ability to, uh, that are fairly nimble and can grow. Um, so they are, they are both publicly traded companies today. Um, Allegiant uh, has done extremely well uh, along the way. It is certainly a product that is not for everybody. Uh, but they run their business well, and they will take you to leisure points around the country, flying from an airport uh, one to three times a week. Um, it's a very interesting product, but certainly very profitable for them. We would all love to have uh, the, the profit margins that company enjoys. Um, the, mature, the mature carriers, so, uh, Delta, United, Alaska, um, are all carrying less domestic, all carried less domestic traffic in 2020. As a percent of 2019, they were joined by JetBlue. Uh, JetBlue, very much a company in transition. Uh, yes, Boston is in lockdown, basically has been locked down pretty much. New York locked down pretty much. And as that's been the case, you see them uh, making some moves across their network, leaving Long Beach and, and entering LAX. Um, JFK uh, is still a, a home to uh, JetBlue, but they have also expanded their operations in the New York metro area to Newark. Uh, so lots of change going on at JetBlue. 
um, Southwest, a company that doesn't add points on its on its route map, um, very many in any one year, um, have already added 17 new dots on its map. Um, a very different story. They're very aggressive in putting markers down in new markets across the country. Um, and Spirit and Frontier, two ULCCs, uh, growing very aggressively and promise to grow aggressively through the summer. Uh, if we just take a look at who's grown and who's not relative to U.S. domestic averages on the right at 41.4, you see Frontier, Allegiance, Spirit, and Sun Country growing fairly aggressively, or, or at least above, above the U.S. domestic average. American is the only carrier um, that exceeded the U.S. domestic um, average in terms of domestic traffic carried by a network airline. Uh, there are many reasons for that that we don't really have time to get into. And then you can see that Southwest pretty much at the, at the domestic average, Delta, United, Alaska, and JetBlue below. below. Um, on the airport side, um, it is, you know, if we think about the last two recessions, the network carriers, American, Delta, and United, recovered much more slowly than other players in the system. Um, we can, ex that is playing out today. We can expect that to be the case, at least in the domestic space in the, in, in the immediate term. Um, initially, uh, we really thought that the network carriers would engage in a zero-sum game and adding capacity. Um, yesterday, Southwest announced a big order, uh, but it seems that that order is also going to be largely for replacement, at least in the immediate term. So none of the incumbent carriers promise a lot of growth, um, at least the more mature carriers. Uh, certainly the ultra-low-cost carriers will grow and grow aggressively. Um, the looming question, I think, for Dulles and, and DCA is going to be United and Americans' decision whether to build back those airports once New York, Boston, Chicago, and California come back online. I think we can feel pretty comfortable about Dulles, um, and, and, and I do believe that DCA, um, Americans' new concourse, they have a lot of good things going on there, um, but, uh, you know, it is uh, definitely lagged. Uh, what it is that America has done across other points in its system. Um, and uh, so, you know, just given the importance of those two airports, uh, we're going to spend some time. But one of the things that has my attention, and I'm sure um, the air service team at, 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 at Dulles, is once the CARES Act money, that is the money that the government granted um, the industry, and as part of that grant, um, uh, 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 ensured that service by regional airlines to points served pre-pandemic would continue to receive service today. Once that money runs out, um, the regional industry is going to be interesting to watch. Uh, I don't believe that all regional markets are going to go away by any means, uh, but the 50 seat jet, every airline has announced um, that it is on its way out of their system uh, they made that very clear in their conference calls last last quarter um, and with the uh, with Wall Street, um, and uh, so the regional space is going to be something to watch, uh, not only from economics but from the availability of the right sized airplane. Uh, certainly, new daily COVID cases on the decline. This has been a great story until all of us woke up or, or watched the news last night when the CDC suggested they're concerned. I don't know how to read this anymore. Maybe you do. Um, I'm encouraged by the decline and the increase in, in vaccines, which we show here. Um, but the fact of the matter is um, this pandemic is... Uh, it, it, it's hard to kill, uh, and it's also very important um, that the pandemic uh, be addressed, not only for, for this industry, which we all love, uh, but also just for the health of the overall economy. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to have an economy um, that uh, lies in the uh, vortex of a pandemic. Um, so, and this industry is so vitally connected to 
um, the health of the, of, the, of the nation's economy. The recovery is gonna be uneven. Um, I, I think we know that and appreciate that and based on what it is that we see today and what it is that I've said, I mean, this is an old map, it really doesn't matter, it still applies. Um, you know, if, if take a look at the areas where, um, uh, you know, the, the pandemic has been most severe in the Northeast um, and, um, and in California and along the West Coast, um, those, those markets are coming back very slowly. It's very hard for airlines to build out their networks without having large markets on each coast um, connected to those hubs. Um, so yes, it's going to be an uneven, an uneven recovery, and I think we can expect that for some time, um, not just not just today. So let's talk about American a little bit. Um, you know, American's biggest hubs are on the far left at DFW and CLT. That's Dallas and Charlotte. Um, they've been very aggressive in in uh, building out those hubs, and and they've done very well. I mean, you know, they've carried you know, more than 56% of the traffic that they carried in 2019 over each of those two hubs in, in 2020. Um, Phoenix, Miami, also coming back, but let's appreciate too, uh, those are points that have sunshine and sunshine is what people want now. Uh, we see DCA and in 2020, American carried uh, less than a third of the, of the traffic it carried in, in 2020. And you can see on the right, the same is true for LGA and JFK in New York. Um, those markets have been very slow to come back and then LAX, Los Angeles as well. So you can see very uneven as to how American has had to approach this um, and certainly hampered uh, by those markets that have been um, uh, restricted in terms of travel. If we look at the hub operations that American is operating out there today, they've added points at Dallas and Charlotte, as you can see, nine and six. Um, but, you know, as LA and LaGuardia and JFK and DCA um, and Philadelphia even are very slow to come back, they've been, they haven't added back all of the, all of the flying that they had in 2019. Um, and Philadelphia, like, like Dallas, is, is highly dependent on international travel. So it's very important to the uh, domestic network there as well. United, um, you know, United, uh, I would say that uh, it's been fairly even-handed as to how it's built out its network, with the exceptions being in New York and on the West Coast. Um, you can see that at the three markets that they built back the fastest have been Denver, Houston, and Washington Dulles. Um, at, at, at Dulles, they've actually begun to add some points compared to what they served in March of 19. Uh, we're always happy to see that. And I believe there was another announcement yesterday. Um, Denver has opened up, but if we think about Denver and what it is that people are asking for, and that is access to points on the map that are wide open spaces um, and less crowded, the mountain region certainly has a lot to offer. And so Denver has uh, performed incredibly well, not only for United, but the other carriers that have large operations there. Uh, in terms of the regional operation, I, again, coming back to that whole CARES Act thing, um, the regional operation is very important to the hub at Dulles. Um, and you can see that um, for the six months ended March 21, um, United is off operating 65.5% of the departures it operated in March of 20 uh, of, of in March of 21 versus versus March of last year. I mean that's that's good news. Um, that's really good news. And what it is that will uh, be incumbent if the 50 C jet is on its way out. Uh, hopefully we will see um, the uh, either the a new 550, which is a, a 50 seat version on a 70 seat platform that's very, very comfortable. 
uh, for all of us. It would be a great ride um, for all of us who use Dulles um, or the more 76 seat flying. That would be that would be great. And then you can also see the regional operations being operated in Denver and Houston. Um, those three hubs again, uh, very, the, the regional operation being very important uh, to building out those networks. I couldn't have this conversation with you without talking about international traffic recovery, and I'm sure not going to spend a lot of time on this busy chart. This is more for nerds like me, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that international recovery is going to be long um, based on, and whether it's as long as this chart suggests, I doubt it, uh, but it's going to be longer than domestic to be sure. Um, and so for those of us uh, in support of Dulles, we know how important the international operation is. And here, um, this looks very, very busy, but if, if what's, what was very important for me, for you to take away are the, are the brighter blue bars. And you see the first one, United at Houston. Um, and what, what, the, what, the, what the bar says is that um, at Houston, 4.6 million passengers continuing on to connect to an international flight fly over the Houston hub. And that equates to 13.7% of their domestic traffic. So if you think about that, and it's enormous. I mean, that means that, you know, basically 15% of the domestic network would have no, nobody in the seats. Um, and so that's why it's so vitally important. And if we look at, at UA and IAD down a little further on the right, 1.9 million passengers um, connect at, at, at uh, Dulles from a domestic flight. And that's the equivalent of 11.9% of the domestic carrier traffic at, at IAD. So we want this international traffic to come back. Um, but it is going to be a little slower and it will have a dampening effect on just how quickly many of these gateway markets will return. Um, you know, it's, it's no secret for those who follow the industry. People want to go to where the sun is. Um, and what this chart shows is uh, in, in uh, March of 21, uh, the industry is operating nearly 77% of the number of departures to Mexico that it operated in March of 19. 63% to Central America, 54% to the Caribbean. Um, that's where people are going. They're going to Mexico and the Caribbean and Central America. Um, and while Africa and the Middle East look very, very interesting, those are very small bases. Uh, what is concerning for all of us um, is that only 27.3% um, of, the, of the departures being operated from the U.S. to Asia and only 22% of the departures from the U.S. to Europe. Uh, we desperately need those markets back online. Um, They're so critical uh, to so many and certainly to Dulles as well. Just thinking about last third quarter and we know that um you know how important uh june or uh, july august and september are um to or june july august however you want to measure it um to to the airlines in terms of carrying traffic um what this says is that during the third quarter of 2020 as compared to 19 United only carried 10.3% of the international traffic it carried a year before. Um, that's a, a tough statement. Uh, United is most exposed to the international market. So we, you can see them uh, very focused on building an operation for tomorrow's international market. But this just kind of gives you a sense of, of, of the struggles that United has faced when the international component is so important. So um, hopefully we'll get some Q&A after this and just some thoughts as we wrap this up. Um, you know, history can be a guide. Um, there certainly has been no historical prece precedent here uh, for the folks at MWA, for the folks at Task Force, for the folks in my world who just track the industry 
I I took the dartboard out of my office because um, it it got worn out. Um, and it's just been tough to really understand where this market's going. I believe that now we're starting to see a bit of a path, um, but certainly the path that's very clear is it's about leisure travel and the ultra low cost carriers are gonna take advantage um, and we'll be, we'll be making a market share grab for sure. Um, at some point though, you know, we need the traffic to come back. We need people to see people in the airports. That helps with consumer confidence. But from an airline point of view, it's, yep, we want the traffic back. But at some point, we're going to have to have a conversation about revenue um, so airlines can stop burning cash and begin to repair balance sheets that have been badly damaged. Um, and that is certainly true when you think about the fact that of that, of that $51 billion, uh, of, of money in, that was borrowed by the industry, 38 billion of that was by American, Delta, and United. Um, the interdependencies of international travel, we don't need to talk about that anymore. Um, at this point, and given the cash position of virtually all airlines operating today, it's hard to imagine that an airline won't make it, um, at least in the immediate term. Um, but again, so much is going to be dependent on the return of business travel and revenue related to business travel. The one thing that I have believed all along is we have, we have airlines that are going to be smaller on the other side. Um, smaller airlines mean that some hubs out there will likely be smaller. Smaller hubs mean less connectivity. Um, to cities of all sizes, but are very important to small communities and less connectivity means that we might lose service to some small communities along the way. So there is a lot to watch. The work is far from done. Um, and, uh, but I, I do believe that um, we should be encouraged by what's happening at Dulles um, and DCA too will return um, but, uh, you know, I do believe that, uh, it, we need to lump it in with the Northeast and it's going to be a slower return than some other geographies on the map. So with that, or any questions, conversation, happy to, happy to do it. All right. Um, Bill, thank you very much. Georgia has asked me to, um, do Q and A and make a few announcements. And I see that uh, some questions have uh, popped up. Um, let's see, from Dave Kirby, does train travel have any effect on air, domes air domestic travel? Yeah, um, you know, I, I mean, unless you're kind of in the Northeast corridor a little bit, um, it, it, it may have some impact. But given the fact that nobody's working downtown DC anymore, I can't believe the train traffic's that much better either. Um, so uh, I think the same concerns on on the virus and cleanliness and all of that. And I do believe that the airline industry and the airport industry has done a superb job um, on on that side. And actually, I think the trains have been are getting there now, but they were they were slower to come than were um, the the airline and airport industry. Hmm. And uh, um, Paul has asked, uh, there was no mention of pr the proposed new carrier Breeze. Can you comment on how Breeze will impact air travel in the coming months? Yeah, I mean, Paul, that's great. I mean, look, uh, we're going to have two, right? We're going to have Breeze and, and we're going to have Andrew Levy's airline. And I understand there may be a Q400 upstart on its way. Um, I, 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 from Breeze's perspective, you know, they've said, I mean, we don't know what they're really going to do, but at least the inkling we get, it's going to be east of the Mississippi. It's going to be with Embraer 190s, and it's going to be in markets that, you know, aren't served nonstop today. And, um, you know, there are a number of points um, that that could be said. And if, you know, Nealman actually, David Nealman, who's the chairman of the company, actually said he saw a number of opportunities in 2019. And I would say, hell, 
if he saw opportunities in 2019, then get on the train right now because there's a lot of opportunities out there for routes that aren't being flown nonstop. And um, certainly the Washington region has opportunity. All right. Um, let's see. We don't have um, any other questions at this time. Um, Bill, I did want to mention that Jack Potter had originally uh, registered to be on with us today, but unfortunately something came up, but he sends his best. Yeah, and I send mine back. Yeah. Um, folks, just um, a couple of announcements, if I may. You'll notice on the uh, chat at the top, I have posted a couple links to upcoming events. April 8th, next uh Next Thursday, our Legislative and Economic Development Committee at 9 a.m. will have a conversation with Greg Potts uh, from WMATA and Keith Jasper, who is uh, with the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, to talk about the Silver Line and the um, supporting transportation network to um, the Silver Line uh, stations. Um, it is a free event, so all are welcome to join. And then on April 26th at Westfields Golf Club, we are having our inaugural um, golfing uh, tournament. Uh, registration that day is at 11 a.m. And, and um, so I hope that uh, if you enjoy golf and want to get out, um, please uh, take the opportunity to register your foursome. And we still have... Um, several opportunities available if you wish to uh, sponsor the event. But again, that link is uh, posted on um, chat. Um, seeing no further um, questions, Georgia, I will turn it over to you to close out the event. And again, thank you, Bill. Um, we appreciate it. Oh, um, do you have any issue if we share your uh, slide deck with the membership? You can send it to the membership. All right. Thank you. You bet. Georgia. You need to unmute, Georgia. There you go. Thank you, Bill. That was an incredible presentation. We're very grateful to have you. Hope to see you more often with us at Committee for Dulles. And very appreciative for Paul Puckley's in, in invitation to you to come, and we're very appreciative for his involvement. And wishing everyone a, a wonderful upcoming Easter, and looking forward to our next meeting, which will be uh, April the 27th, a Tuesday from 12 to 1, and the topic to be announced. And you'll get an email um, regarding that. We're waiting for a final confirmation. <laughs>